So here's a Stingray type pickup I've had for several years. It was quite cheap. I think it's an old all parts pickup. I honestly can't remember. I've had it in one of my main bases and gigged with it quite a lot over the last few years. Um, but there's a couple of things about it I'd like to change. Uh, so in this video I'm going to tear it apart, rewind it and put it back together again. The main issue with the pickup is that it's overwound. Uh, the coils are 6k. Uh, but the current Stingray pickups typically have coils that are about 4K, and as far as I know, the original 70s ones had coils that were only wound to 3K. Uh, so I'm going to rewind them to about 3.5K, and this will drop the inductance right down and raise the resonant frequency up by about an octave, I would think. The downside of this is that I'll obviously lose a little bit of output, but I can make up for that by tweaking the gain of the preamp that's in the base. The pickup also doesn't have reverse wound coils. Uh, the magnets are reversed, so it does hum cancel, but it means that one row of pole pieces will always buzz uh, when you touch them. While I've got the pickup apart, I'll earth the pole pieces so none will buzz, and it gives me the option to wire the pickup in either phase. And finally, I'm going to shim the top of the bobbin slightly so that they actually sit lower in the cover and so that the pole pieces are flush with the top of the cover. As you can see, the first step is to remove all the hot glue that's holding the coils in. When you're using a heat gun like this, you want to keep the pickup moving so you don't melt or distort the cover. It's common to use copper tape like this to earth pole pieces, but in this pickup it's not connected to them for some reason and the shield from the lead is not even soldered to it. Uh, so in this case the tape does nothing. Now that most of the hot glue is removed, I can run a blade around each bobbin uh, to help release it from the cover. Stingray pickup covers have a central wall that separates the coils, so when you're at each end there, just make sure you don't cut through this. Because I'm planning to rewind this, I'm not being terribly careful with the way I'm removing the glue and how I'm handling the wiring uh, at the eyelets. But if you're planning to overwind or do some other repair work, you really have to tread carefully here. Pickup coils are quite fragile and they're easily damaged. I could have just finished cleaning up the bobbins and rewound them as is, but I decided to take off the magnets just to see why that copper tape wasn't actually touching the pole pieces. So I'm just peeling off the last of the hot glue uh, so I can pop the magnet up with my blade. With these sort of pickups they're normally just held on with a couple of drops of glue um, and the first guy popped right off, uh, but unfortunately the other one needed much more force and it came off in two pieces. But that's not the end of the world. I'll show you how I repaired that magnet in just a sec. Uh, but right now I'll scrape the glue from the magnet and I'll also remove the excess solder from these eyelets. That blue thing in my left hand there is a desoldering pump. Uh, it's basically a spring-loaded syringe that sucks up molten solder. They're like 10 bucks and I honestly couldn't live without it. The trouble with plastic bobbins like this is that the melting point of solder is much higher than ABS plastic. So you have to work very fast, and even still, the plastic around the eyelet will melt. Looks like that's happened here, so I'm going to carefully warm them and push them down with the iron so they don't snag on the winding wire. When a magnet breaks in line with its axis, it's going to want to repel and kind of twist when you put it back together. Uh, so I've taped and clamped both halves to the bench. Uh, I've also ruled a pencil line on the tape to keep it all lined up and of course the tape stops you from gluing the magnet to your bench. I used Loctite 480 just because I happen to have some um, and it has a slower setup time than standard super glue uh, but gel super glue uh, would work as well. There is a chip missing uh, but the other side is nice and flat so I'll use that side for the pole pieces.
So here I'm pushing the pole pieces down so they're slightly proud of that lower side of the bobbin. Uh, this way they'll sit right on the magnet. Uh, they were actually sitting slightly high, plus they had glue on the bottom of them, so I'm guessing that's why the copper tape wasn't making uh, an ohmic connection with them. I've also had a better idea for earthing these pole pieces anyway, which I'll come to. Make sure you glue the magnets so one coil is north and the other is south. I just use a little compass from a camping store to keep tabs on this. Sometimes I catch my fingertip calluses on pole pieces that stick up like this. These ones aren't really too bad, but I've come up with an idea to make them flush and permanently earth them in one go. I'm going to solder an earth wire to these, uh, plus I'm going to zigzag it across the top of the bobbin, and the thickness of that wire will act as a spacer and make the pole pieces uh, nice and flush on top. Bear in mind that you can't solder to Alnico, so if you've got Alnico pole pieces you'll need to earth them another way. That's normally done with a strip of copper tape, uh, but in my experience the conductive adhesive tends to fail over time. I'm not really sure why. So I normally use some combo of copper tape and conductive paint, uh, depending on the bobbin design. To solder up to something as big as these pole pieces, I use my 80 watt iron. These heatsink clips are ideal for holding the wire in place. I'm just going to file the excess solder with a nut slot file. And here I'm creating just a little clearance fillet with a countersinking bit. It's a good idea to insulate the pole pieces from the inner windings, otherwise they'll short on that first layer of wire. Normally of course you'd run the start of the coil to earth anyway, but if you had to reverse the phase of the pickup, or you wanted to wire it in series, the coil would have no output. You can use just about any self-adhesive tape for this. Masking tape's nice because you can score it with a Stanley blade and just peel it off at the right width. So now it's the fiddly and slightly surgical task, I guess, <laughs> of threading the eyelets. In this shot, I know it throws the white balance off, uh, but I've pulled my overhead lamp in close so I can see what I'm doing. It's a good idea to actually wrap and knot the wire two or three times, especially since these eyelets are going to melt the plastic and move a bit every time you solder them. Here's the winder I made as a teenager. Over the years I've built a few others with, you know, sewing machine motors and stuff. Uh, but I'm trying to keep it simple in these videos, and this actually works very well. It's an old hand-cranked sharpening wheel I found at like a garage sale or something. It's geared about 9 to 1, so it hums along fairly quickly. A typical core will only take 5 or 6 minutes to wind with this. And for hobby stuff, that's really all you need. Notice I've painted the end of that mounting board white. This helps you see and feed the winding wire. I've obviously replaced the sharpening stone with that red timber spacer and I've glued a magnet to the flange there to trigger a hall effect sensor that's connected to a digital counter. I think I made this from a Dick Smith kit back in the day but I'm sure you'd be able to find something ready made and cheap on eBay or Amazon. I've even seen guys hack a cheap pedometer for this job. Don't laugh but that's actually blue tack I'm using to attach the bobbin to the winder. I know it looks a bit sketchy but at these sort of winding speeds it works fine. And you can put just about any bobbin design right on there, uh, top or bottom. Good lighting's essential for this sort of thing, and it looks like I'm kind of sitting in the dark there. But again, it's because I've pulled an overhead lamp in close to see the wire clearly, and my phone camera isn't really coping. And it's about here when I noticed something you guys may have spotted. I only taped that other bobbin. It was late at night. <laughs> so off camera, I took it back to my other bench, taped it off, um, and then kicked off the wind.
painting the coils like this is what's known as lacquer potting. It holds any loose windings together so they don't become microphonic. And it gives the coil a bit of scuff resistance, I guess. Super glue works really well for this. Uh, you can see the first drops sort of disappear into the coil, so it does penetrate okay. But if you're making high output lead guitar pickups, you should probably stop once or twice during the wind for a coat of super glue, or really look into wax potting. There's tons of videos on this. If you actually want to use nitro lacquer or something for potting, it's a good idea to test the lacquer on your winding wire to make sure the solvents don't melt its insulation. So after checking the coils have opposite magnetic polarity, I can go ahead and check that their signals will be in phase. The meters on millivolts and the black probe is connected to the start of each winding. You can see I get a positive reading when I pull the screwdriver up off the pole pieces, so I'll check the other coil also gives a positive reading in the same setup. For a stingray pickup, the coils are wired in parallel, so here I'm preparing the lead by adding a little jumper wire to each core. I'm pre-tinning and trimming all four coil connections because again I have to be very quick with the iron for these eyelets. I'm getting a little puddle of solder in the eyelets just hot enough to push the wire into then I'm out of there. A strip of copper tape makes a convenient place to solder the earth wires from the pole pieces to the shield from the pickup lead. Unless you've got Teflon wire or something, it's a good idea to use a heatsink clip when you're soldering the shield. Otherwise, there's a good chance you'll melt the inner insulation downstream and cause a short. So the shield is twisted, tinned, trimmed. Uh, I'll heatsink it again, then I can solder it in place. Originally the pickup's resonant frequency was at 6 kHz, and as hoped, by underwinding it you can see it's jumped almost an octave to 10k. Next I'll use this driver coil to run some frequency sweeps. You can see that above the resonant frequency there's a sharp 12dB per octave roll-off. Virtually all magnetic guitar pickups will have this. Just for this video I decided to temporarily wire the coils in series uh, to show you guys what your ears have probably already told you uh, if you've ever wired a series parallel switch. In series the resonance drops by an octave, in this case down to 5k. And when you compare sweeps you can see the output is hotter by 5 or 6 dB. The scope's input impedance is 1 meg and for my base where the pickup directly feeds the preamp, like most stingrays, that treble peak will certainly be audible. But if you have a passive bass, or if you have a volume pot between the pickup and the preamp, then those peaks, of course, are far more gentle. Your bass may actually start to roll treble off quite a bit below its pickup's resonant frequency. Here the coils are back in parallel, and I'm wiring a 2.2 nanofarad cap across the pickup. This is to demonstrate a little quirk of the classic three-band Stingray preamp, because for whatever reason, that's exactly what it has right across its input. You can see that this creates a resonant peak at about 3k, and to my ear at least, that's a big part of the three band stingray sound, that sort of clicky, aggressive treble tone. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you'd like to see more of this sort of stuff, let me know in the comments, or if you know someone who might be interested in bass guitar mods, I'd love it if you tagged them or shared the video. And of course, hit subscribe. See ya.